meet Martha. She's a mother of two and a refugee seeking asylum in the United States. She's been living and working here for a number of years, and while her children are citizens, Martha is not. One day, Martha is suddenly deported. She is arrested and forcibly separated from her children. This is tragic. What will happen to her children, left alone to survive without their mother? How can Martha pass on bank account information, identification cards, power of attorney, and other legal documents that could help her children to thrive without her. You see, there's a bit of a dilemma here. Martha cannot store these documents in any place where the government might be able to access it, so as not to implicate her. So banks and post offices are out of the question. Also, current websites like Google Drive and Dropbox will not work because these sites can read or delete your data at any time without your permission. Also, Martha cannot just give this document to somebody else. What if they get arrested? Or what if they decide to take Martha's belongings ahead of time? So what's Martha to do? How can she have complete control of her data without trusting any third parties? The answer to this question holds the key to the future of the internet. By leveraging new technologies like blockchain and publicly accessible databases, Martha can secure this data with encryption keys that are known only to her daughters. Then she can store this encrypted data in a publicly accessible database that's not controlled by any government or corporation. When the time comes, Martha can press a button and know for sure that only her daughters can read her message. Myself and a group of researchers are working in conjunction with the United We Dream Foundation to make this a reality. Now I want to tell you a little story about the internet. When the founders of the internet first got together, they had a dream that every single person in the world would be connected to every other person, and each one of us would have complete control over who we were and what we could do on the internet. It was about 1995, and around this time, most websites were read-only, just a home page, about us page, and a contact form. And there were only about 45 million people on the internet which was less than 1% of the global population at the time. Even fewer people knew how to make websites. In fact, if you knew how to make a website in 1996, you would be considered a genius. You would drop out of school and be paid extreme amounts of money by some company just to make their homepage. And so things were. But then, over time, more and more people started to learn how to make websites. And these newly minted software developers had some crazy ideas. They thought, hey, instead of just accepting the information that we see on the internet, what if we could contribute our own knowledge and our own ideas to the rest of the world? Instead of just one person making websites for everybody else, what if we could build the internet together? These ideas were powerful and profound, and they helped give rise to the current era of the internet, the era that we call Web 2.0, and it's all about sharing. From baby pictures, to status updates, to restaurant reviews, even physical property like homes and cars, we are now hyper-connected. And even more importantly, we went from just 1% of the world having access to the internet to now over 50% of the world having access to the internet. This has affected our human existence in very fundamental ways. Now, a software developer in rural India can work full-time for a startup in San Francisco. Civil rights activists in Egypt can connect with like-minded individuals in London and orchestrate a political movement. Young girls in Africa can take math classes at Stanford and Harvard without ever leaving their home. We're living in a world without borders. So this is great, right? It feels like we've achieved the dream of the Internet's founders. Well, not so fast. While Web 2.0 has brought us a long way towards the internet of I to we, we still fall short in a few fundamental ways. One example is data sovereignty. So let me ask you a question. When you store that baby picture onto Facebook, who owns that copy of the baby picture? Is it you or is it Facebook? What about all those driving directions that you looked up on Google? Who owns that? Do you own that or does Google own that? 
The answer is that as of today, Facebook and Google basically control all of the data that you generate on their platforms. This means that for most people, they don't even control their own internet identity. So, another example is international money transfer. How come it's so easy to send text messages and videos to Nigeria, but we still have to rely on Western Union just to send money? I mean, money is just a set of numbers in a database, just like a text message is just a set of letters in a database. So why the difference? Another example is censorship. While the internet is a bastion of free speech for most people, governments routinely block certain websites and sometimes the internet as a whole whenever it interferes with their agenda. Citizens in China cannot access any websites on the country's banned list. The US military blocks its personnel from, access, from reading certain news sites. And countries like Cuba, Syria, and Chad will sometimes unplug the entire internet just to keep their citizens from communicating with each other. We are not living the dream of the internet. So how do we solve this? The answer lies in the next wave of the internet. The era we call Web3, where everyone will have unrestricted rights and access to the internet. Everyone will have complete control of their own internet identity. This era will expand the concept of sharing and redefine the concept of ownership. Web3 is powered by one core idea. That idea is transparency. Transparency powered by blockchain technology. So what is a blockchain? A blockchain is basically a peer-to-peer -peer database where every single participant maintains their own copy of all the transactions that happen within the ecosystem. This means that everybody can see what's going on, but no one entity can control the network. Blockchains were invented by an anonymous individual named Satoshi Nakamoto, who also simultaneously invented a cryptocurrency known as Bitcoin. Now, nobody knows if Satoshi is a real person or a pseudonym used by researchers. But Satoshi's contributions to the future of the internet cannot be ignored. Thanks to blockchain, you will be able to send money overseas instantly and for cheaper than you ever have before. Instead of giving your data out for free, you will be able to sell your data directly to advertisers and keep the profit for yourself. And governments will have a much tougher time trying to censor the internet. Web3 is a future full of amazing opportunities. And it's, gonna, it's bringing us much closer to a decentralized internet, an internet of we. So you may ask yourself, how can I participate in this future? How can I join a revolution? The first step is to get educated. I encourage you to read an article or watch a YouTube video about blockchain technology and learn about its implications for our future. Then spread the word. Talk to your friends or join a discussion on your favorite social media network. And if you're a software developer, learn how to make blockchain applications now and bring us all one step closer to a fully decentralized world. One step closer from an internet of I to an internet of we. Thank you.